this podcast is probably the first place I've ever been able to really like lay out a lot of this stuff. Welcome to VP Land, the podcast where we explore how making media is getting faster, easier, and less expensive to create from AI to virtual production and everything in between. I am Joey Dowd, your host. You just heard from Stephen Findison, better known as CoffeeZilla. CoffeeZilla is a YouTuber and investigative journalist exposing online scams. With over 3 million subscribers, you're probably familiar with some of his work. From his three-part series investigating Logan Paul's crypto zoo to his interviews with Sam Bankman-Fried during the collapse of FTX. But what sets CoffeeZilla apart is the way he delivers in-depth, sometimes complicated information, from animated evidence boards to conversations with Maxwell, his robot bartender. All of this is delivered inside a cyberpunk, film noir-style office that CoffeeZilla calls the $10 million studio. Welcome to the $10 million studio. The $10 million studio. The $10 million studio. And in this episode of VP Land, we are going to explore how CoffeeZilla went from a basic set in his bedroom to a full-blown virtual production studio in just a few short years. I want to create something new. I want to create something original. I want to create a world that informs the audience and myself, like sort of what this show is. We'll explore how CoffeeZilla got into virtual production. I want to be one of the people who really pushes this landscape of indie virtual production forward in a practical way. The driving motivator behind every video he creates. Like virtual production is great, but it always is subservient to the storytelling. Some tips and important lessons learned. Just a little high level tip for you guys out there. Any you on practice and a whole lot more links for everything we talk about are available in the youtube description or in the show notes and be sure to subscribe to the vp land newsletter to stay ahead of the latest tech changing the way we're making movies just go to vp-land.com i think in a space like this it's fine to kind of pull back the curtain tell you guys a few of my tricks so let's pull back the curtain and dive into this chat with coffeezilla all right. Well, Stephen Coffeezilla, thanks for joining. I appreciate it. Let's nerd out about stuff that you don't normally talk about. Your virtual production setup, the ten million dollar studio. There was a comment I came across in one of your older videos when you were still recording. I assume it was a room in your house, which just had a basic YouTuber kind of setup. Um, but the comment was semi recent. The video was from twenty nineteen. Comment was recent. Only just found Coffeezilla, watching the progression from fresh-faced crusader of truth to a grizzled, bearded, cynical detective of a dystopian future is, from a lore perspective, absolutely amazing. So I like how it captures this transformation from filming YouTube videos in a room to this elaborate cyberpunk film noir studio they've got. So can you walk me through, like, how did this evolve and, like, what were the motivations behind it? Yeah, sure. Um, by the way, thanks for having me. So to just to back up a bit, I started YouTube and it was really cl- I had no production experience, no film experience. And it was very clear to me that, um, you know, somehow you had to break out and create an original style. I saw uh, the YouTubers are sort of like famous. We all kind of copy each other. And that's good for a while. But eventually, if you ever want any, I feel like uniqueness, longevity, you want to go out and develop your own thing. So at a certain point, I really started getting serious about that. I, I built like my first ever set and I was like, oh, this is amazing. You know, you don't have to move cameras all the time. You could just like set stuff up. Um, and around that time, I heard a TED talk by this guy, David Corins, I believe. Um, it's about three ways to design your life or something like that. I can send it to you and maybe you can link it in the show notes because this, yeah, this, we'll find this it. talk yeah. absolutely changed my world. Because basically this guy says, you can't, he's like, um, you basically have to design a set for what you want to be. Essentially, he used this word, which doesn't ring as true now because of recent events. He did a set design for Kanye. He's done set designs for Hamilton, stuff like that. And he's like, the design of the world tells you something about what you're watching. And even for the creator, it tells you something about who you are. So he talks about like, you know, Kanye didn't tell me explicitly he wanted to be a god. But as I talked to him in the process of like how to create a set, I realized sort of we were actualizing who he was and wanted to be through this like creation of a set and this world. Um, and then he kind of lays out some simple ideas of, you know, how you can go out and do it yourself. And I was so taken by this idea. He's like, he's like, you know, Kanye can't be Kanye in his living room. Again, it means something different now because of whatever. But um, at the time, at the time, nothing like, like like he was like pop culture icon, right? So I heard this and I was like, that's true. You can't be, you know, that in your bedroom. And then I looked at my set, like right over there. I'm like watching this video and I'm looking at my set and it's a dude in a bedroom. And I'm like, oh, I want it. And so things started clicking. I'm like, I want to create something new, but I can't do this in my bedroom. Like I, I can't. 
And so how am I going to do it? So I looked around at other YouTubers. What are other YouTubers doing? What are other people even in film doing? And a few things tied together for me, which is one, I saw Linus Tech Tips. He had built out this mm -hmm. like giant, you know, warehouse and he had spent like $10 million and he was able to fit like five sets in there, you know, five, like five different, you know, angle. and I was like, dang, that's a lot of money for, um, <laughs> you know, and he talks about like, you have to spend more and then. When you buy the warehouse, now you have to spend even more to like soundproof it. All this, like I was like, I, I can't do that. Um, and then at the same time, I watched the Mandalorian behind the scenes, which I think hit a lot of people. And I just sort of had this like breakthrough moment where I was like, you can do infinite things with this one, you know, virtual production set. Like you can just you can have a million sets. And I was I was struck by that. I was like, man, you can create a whole world functionally in a bedroom and like sort of cheat the whole system. Like you don't actually have to go out and get. So it started as this like quest of convenience and like, oh, it's going to make my life easy. Um, little did I know, by the way, uh, <laughs> it's, it, it comes with its own set of problems. So, so I started this march down like, okay, well, I want to create something new. I want to create something original. I want to create a world that tell, like informs the audience and myself like sort of what this show is. Um, so I started obsessing sort of like what that looks like. That's when I sort of started down this rabbit hole of, you know, the $10 million studio. That started because all these scammers that I was talking about, the way they would establish credibility is they would talk about how rich they were. So obviously I'm just a dude in my bedroom, but I'm like, <laughs> but I'm like, it's funny to just kind of go way above them and just be like, oh, 10 million, just, just my studio is $10 million and just fake everything. So like for a long time, we had a Lamborghini in the studio. Which was a whole thing because all these guys that I was talking about, they'd have these, like, there's cars in these ridiculous places. Like, they'd have it in their front lawn. Like, you don't actually have that, right? You just place it there for social proof. So I just basically stole what they were doing and made it, like, a satire, like, like um, pastiche. And then it sort of, which I kind of loved, kind of became, like, a joke that wasn't a joke anymore. Because eventually, if you pr push your production enough, it is almost plausible that it's a $10 million studio. Um, so that's kind of like this like fun thing, but yeah, that's when I started down that like path of trying to work on virtual production and I knew nothing. I mean, I, I am like true amateur who just like studied people. I would shamelessly approach anybody who had a better key than me, a better anything industry professionals would be like, how are you doing this? Why does your key look so good? And they're like, oh, well, cause I'm not using OBS. And I'm like, oh, okay, well. <laughs> I was using that. Um, so then they're like, you should get, you know, the ultimate or whatever. Um, eventually, by the way, for a lot of reasons, which we can talk about, I mm -hmm. I now use Eximetry for King. I've, I've tried the ultimate, yeah, guys. I, I know. You have to. Okay. That was one of my, yeah, I but, saw your tweet from a few years but ago. I don't and... like, I dude, I'm, I'm going to say I put them in the head to head. I think Eximetry is competitive and the compositing is like a million times better. I think people who are still like on the ultimate train, you're on an outdated system. I mean, it's not outdated in terms of, it's an amazing keyer, but the way you can like composite to me is so maybe just someone hasn't explained to me the right pipeline, but I just think it's so limiting and Eximetry, you can just build stuff so much easier. So anyway, that's like a little aside, but yeah, like I start working on my key. Then they're like, well, how are you lighting yourself? And I'm like, well, yeah, my light is just keying me and then it's lighting my green screen. And they're like, oh no, 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 like, you can't, <laughs> you can't do that. And they're like, how close are you to your wall? And I'm like, oh, like three feet away. And they're like, no, 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 you can't do that. So um, so yeah. I just start to slowly um, kind of work on it. And I think what's interesting is like a lot of the seeds I started developing like three or four years ago um, are like paying off now. Like the vision I had in my head then of like sort of what I wanted to, you know, achieve. People are talking about like now, like, oh, wow. Like it's, you know, uh, they're noticing the stuff that I started trying to like build in my head a long time ago. So I think that's been interesting to watch uh, happen. And I'm very grateful that people kind of dig it. Sorry, that was like the longest answer ever. No, it was great. And I mean, yeah, there's a lot of tangents and stuff to, to jump in on. And I mean, yeah, it's just been interesting even just going through the video history and how quickly your style seemed to develop from 2021. I think there was like sort of the first uses of like green screen, but you just maybe, I, I assume it was like a photo or just some sort of like bulletin board uh, with the lines everywhere. You did the very first virtual studio builds, the CoffeeZilla studio, and that was somewhat interactive where you were hitting some button off screen and you could display your computer screen in your virtual space. What was the sort of first step from like just a green screen to you started building stuff and what were you like uh, running on and uh, doing it? Yes, I was really interested in building my own space and uh, kind of, like I said, create, creating this 
cohesive world. I didn't want to just take off the shelf like little backgrounds. At the same time, I didn't really have the hardware to run a live like simulation behind me. I didn't have the hardware to like run an unreal scene behind me. So I realized I'm going to have to do some combination of a rendered MP4, but the set will be 3D. So if I want to get any new angles, we can just go pick a new angle, render out like a five second loop, and then basically like stitch that all together. I lucked out here because this is when I found my 3D artist who I've been working with like ever since the first uh, thing. Ed Lashinsky, he's a Ukrainian guy, absolute killer. We've kind of developed together a style. I got very lucky there. I want to be clear. I have probably sketches of my original idea and it's literally chicken scratch. I'm like, you know, this is what it should be like, just like one square. And then he turns it into this whole developed idea. But it's kind of amazing how much thought you have to put into some of that stuff behind the scenes to make, to kind of give a cohesive world. Because we thought so much about, we have so many mood boards, so many different things. And then it all just like becomes one finished thing eventually. But um, we kind of went back and forth on that forever. And we've had several iterations of the same studio where we've like modified little things. A lot of it becomes out of necessity, like you want the set to be functional. So you want it to display information. Sometimes like, especially when we started, I had this gimmick where we had like a screen that would flip out behind me. The whole point of it was a way to display my computer in world without it like just being like a little picture in picture. Because I, I just find that, you know, unmotivated information display kind of comes off as like uh, cheap. I mean, anywhere, anyone can do it. Everyone does it. Like just put me in picture in picture. And then I just don't think that's that interesting. Um, more and more in my show, I'm trying to make the information like come in world. This is like one kind of principle we established early on is anything that's like found digitally, we want to make into a physical place like the Internet Archive. I can just go to www.internetarchive. That's not interesting. So since I solve like these like or not solve, but like I, I bust these like um, Internet scams, I want to find a way to make them kind of into a narrative, into a story. Uh, so we'll actually make an Internet Archive location. If I know the audience is going to ask a question, but I don't just want to completely fourth wall it and be like, I know you guys are thinking blah, blah, blah. I'll go to the bar and talk to my robot bartender and he'll like kind of play the audience. So things like that um, kind of helped us, I think, a little bit. But um, that's kind of one principle we're trying to figure out. A new thing I think we're going to develop is a, uh, a place for like discord calls, like calls like this, like where I interview victims. I think it's so lame mm -hmm. to just do like, oh, just cut away to a picture and, you know, just like, here's this guy in this random location. I think it's cool to bring stuff in world wherever you can. All right, real quick, just jumping back in here again. If you are enjoying this conversation with CoffeeZilla, then you will like the VP Land newsletter. Each week, twice a week, we send you all sorts of news, links, in-depth articles, behind the scenes stuff about virtual production, AI and video, and all of the other latest technology and news that is changing the way we're making movies, how to make things better, faster, less expensive. From professional level to YouTube, not to say that it's not professional, we've got everything covered. So be sure to subscribe to VP Land. You can get the link in the YouTube description description or the show notes or just head over to vp-land.com and now back to my chat with coffeezilla yeah um no and you've definitely mentioned a lot of things and i'm trying to figure out the best way to navigate this because it's like a lot of high level questions and then uh nitty-gritty questions that i've got but yeah. going back to the high level because you're talking about you know building out this space and delivering information in world which uh you know something that you really do really well G going back to the high level view of this, because um, one of the articles that you mentioned, like you're, you're building out the CoffeeZilla cinematic universe, going back to your mood boards and everything, how much of this was driven as a way to more entertainingly deliver the information for the story and also as like a competitive advantage for the channel of just raising the bar in quality versus like doing, I know your origin was like video essays, but like versus just, you know, someone doing faceless video channels. Uh, so like, has is, is that been one of the driving motivations as well? Yeah, I, th I think the big driving motivation probably would be like some form of originality, um, some type of self, I don't know, it's kind of like a self-expression thing. I really get a kick out of building this thing out and having some, um, I feel like there are two things that are going on. Like you have these stories which come and go. Every video is just its own like kind of self-contained thing. And then I think it's fun to, as a channel, kind of build something. So it's given me this sense of um, progress that I don't think I would have otherwise had had I stayed stagnant of just doing things the same way. I always find that channels that stay the same for 10 years, well, I won't say anything about it, but I personally would not want to do I, I want to develop as a creator and my audience to feel like, oh, his sense of style is, he's not just like mailing it in and just getting lazy and just doing the same thing. 
every video, it feels like he's putting everything on the table and trying to push a little bit farther. So may, may, maybe that's my motivation. I also think in particular with virtual production, like I think because it's a fledgling kind of industry, it's been so interesting to watch. On the indie side, we haven't seen as much practical application of virtual production. It's been a lot of tech demos, basically. And I remember thinking really early on, I want to be one of the people who really pushes this landscape of indie virtual production forward in a practical way, where instead of talking about the tech, instead of, which I, I love to do, by the way, because I'm a nerd, but um, I want to actually, I want to show that narrative, it can compete with building out a huge set and hiring a bunch of production and grips and whatever. Um, I want to show that not only can it compete, it's actually, I think, in a lot of cases, more competitive um, and people just sort of haven't figured it out yet. So that was what I was hoping to kind of give back to this industry that I kind of love, have a secret love for, I guess, um, is kind of just showcase, hopefully, how cool and interesting and, and approachable I don't know approachable is the right word. I actually think virtual production is really hard. <laughs> I think to do it right is like actually really hard. But um, but yeah, show 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 sort of what it can do. Yeah, you have one of your videos where you sort of like lift the curtain a little bit and you're like, this is all virtual production. And that video is about two years old now. And you're like, YouTubers are sleeping on this. Uh, you know, you should get on the ground floor now. Uh, this is sort of a game changer. But that was like two years ago. So I mean, and I feel, I mean, I feel like you're definitely the biggest the most sort of virtual production stuff that I've seen, like from like a big YouTuber. I mean, Mr. Beast is very practical. They're using a lot more visual effects for like set extensions, but I wouldn't call that. They do cool CGI stuff because everyone kind of, everyone looks at like the top guy. So I think he'll actually have a huge effect on bringing like set extensions, stuff like that in. I just think it's great anytime someone uses these tools and doesn't talk like, I think it's great to talk about it, but I also think it's great to just show it just invisibly it's not nobody right, just comes to appreciate to it and not think yeah. of like where's the what's the magic trick right nobody comes to my videos thinking well not nobody but a lot of people don't come to my videos thinking oh i'm going to see virtual production today <laughs> it's just this invisible tool that just helps things look a little bit better helps the narrative flow a bit better and i'm happy to have that in the background my other part of my question with that is have you seen more like besides this possible Mr. B set extension example, have you seen other YouTubers or people adapt this as much as you have? We could set that as a bar, but even just lesser, not as much as you have. Well, I think I've kind of just gone full sin down the rabbit hole. I kind of just like my whole, the yeah, whole like room sin, that I'm in right city, now is Zilla, black and sin green. City. Yeah. yeah, like it's all, I'm fully devoted. I have no interest in a fully practical set. I've come to appreciate the benefits of having some practical tools on set. And I think there are limitations that people like amateurs don't get. I think industry obviously understands it. But um, on the amateur side, sometimes we can think we can paint everything green. That's what I thought forever. Like I was, tr I was like trying to paint like chairs green, tables were green, everything was green. That's a problem. Just a little <laughs> high level tip for you guys out there. Anything you touch on set should be practical. It's so exhausting trying to manually track whatever, uh, uh, you know, stuff you touch because you're going to create all these shadows. It's going to be a nightmare. Just do yourself a favor. Floors, try to make them practical. Things you touch like chairs or like if you're touching a table, you know, please just make it practical. A, a cup, make it practical. These things are supposed to help you. And I think if you get too overly zealous about I'm 100% virtual production, you're going to be like me and trying to key out a green table where your arm's touching it and it's you're trying to sa save contact shadows. It's a disaster. You don't want to deal with that. Um, last year, I kind of took a little bit, went a little bit the other way and built out some nice practical like little set pieces um, to help myself out a little bit. And that has been a huge game changer because people mm. will be like, wow, this composite looks go so good. It's like, yeah, because the composite is half real, half green. And so... It really, your brain starts to like be like, well, what is going on here? What were some of the sets, like your desk or what, what What are some of the set pieces you built? Yeah, so my main desk, like at the main Coffee Zilla -like set in the $10 million studio, that's now practical with like some cups, some papers, some stuff like that. That's nice because it adds some depth. I think sometimes, you know, when you're just sitting like this, you're just kind of floating in air. There's no depth. It's just like sort of you are a plane and then there's this mm -hmm. background plane behind you. And I think it always makes sense to have some type of um, some things creating like not illusion, but yeah, some sense of uh, there's some depth to this scene, right? That we're not getting here. That's achievable a few ways. If your camera's locked off, though, 
you know, it's it's achievable by things like a desk or something like, in you know, in the background or, or something practical. I, I also did it in my bartender scene where we built an actual kind of this bespoke bar top where uh, we have like this like light tube going through the middle. All of that's real. There's like Lexan plastic on it to diffuse the light in this really cool way that we shamelessly stole from The Shining. And then it's kind of cool because the bartender, like my robot bartender, can like reach across this physical bar and I'm touching the physical bar. And then like, it's just this cool, you can kind of just play with the audience a bit. Um, so so those are some basic examples. But we've also like built out some floors. Like I have you know, like a piece of plywood, put some vinyl like flooring on it. So if I'm standing somewhere, we don't have to key out this green floor and try to pull context shadows. That's a nightmare. Um, it's a lot easier if you can just save it, you know? It's all there. So th those kinds of things um, were huge lessons. There's another one where I'm like leaning over a rail. So I actually went out and like bought a rail and like screwed it into, you know, a lot of it's so janky. Like it's amazing how much like with props, things can be janky, but as 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 long as you do it right, it like good. the audience, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the audience doesn't ever have to know. Like it's like, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, even if you feel like uh, one small push is going to break off, as long as it looks good, you're, you're good. Yes. Yeah, so so the green screen has just been a way to um, I, I've come to appreciate it as a uh, a way to just cheat what can be easier. I think James Cameron like is famous for saying on green screen things that are hard in real life are easy, and things that are easy in real life are hard. I think that's really true. If you want some epic sweep of the Himalayan mountains, you could build it on Fiverr with a CG artist for five bucks in like five minutes. Or you could hire a helicopter to go out there and shoot it for real on an Ari Alexa. So they're very two different things in scope. But if you wanted to go have a person open a door and walk through it, if you want to do that fully in CG, it's actually pretty hard. And if you want to do that practically, it's so easy. So I always um, took away from that like nugget of truth to, to actually just use both for what's the best thing I think is um, kind of like a little bit of a mix. You use the CG stuff where you can just really cheat stuff and make stuff look awesome for cheap. Um, and then you use practical stuff when it's like, hey, I don't want to manually track this thing in my hand. I want to actually just have it, you know, get a cheap prop that looks cool for like 30 bucks and call it a day. Let's jump through. Um, let's just take more some more of your recent videos as an example, um, mm -hmm. since you've got this evolving higher end pipeline down. But can you walk me through step by step, uh, just like stage by stage, what the uh, development process is from from the research stage? Yeah. So um, obviously, we're talking a lot about like the virtual production side. There is this whole other like research journalism mm -hmm. aspect, which doesn't have a lot to do with virtual production, but it is a big part of my pipeline. So we'll research stuff, then I'll start to compile it in a script. And then at some point, we have to start storyboarding it, um, which is sort of where the virtual production and actual facts come together. I've started to do this in previs. I used to just skip previs. Our shots were so simple that there was no point. I mean, it's like me standing, I could have done like 20 minutes of me standing in front of the desk and that was our previs. Um, mm -hmm. Now we have, you know, a lot of narrative elements. So because our pipeline takes so long, it actually makes sense to put together like a simple render. Mm -hmm. I use this app on iPad called, I think, Previs Pro. It's like a Sims builder where you can build out these little characters, basic 3D world. You don't have to be a 3D expert because I'm certainly not. And then you can just move a camera around and just kind of pick some shots, pick some shots, pick some shots. The point is not to get some kind of photo reel, you know, thing. It's just basically, basically to create an animatic as someone who doesn't know how to animate or draw well. Like the, the days of stick figures are really starting to fail me because as you want to do more complicated shots, I think you kind of do have to be a bit more precise in um, how it looks. You know, many a time I've been on a call with my CG guy. He's like, what are you doing with all these arrows? And I'm like, it's obviously a push in. And he's like, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. So, uh, so, so, so there's that. And then we go from storyboarding to kind of a, we start to shoot it. Then we send that to my editor because we'll like, Let's say we're shooting something. Let's say we're shooting like a sh scene in the bar where I'm trying to do some things. We're going to shoot four different angles for that. We're going to shoot probably A cam on my face, B cam mm -hmm. from the side, over the shoulder shots to catch my bartender, but we want my shoulder in there kind of reacting. And so we'll shoot all that, but we don't want to have my CG guy just waste a bunch of render stuff by rendering all of it. We'll send it to my editor so he edits some like finished green screen version of it. And then we will kind of, I've at this point captured all the data. So like relevant camera data is like the height of the camera, the distance from the subject, the focal length, the, you know, different 
physical attributes we're going to have to match in CG that he's not mm. going to want to have to match manually. Are you um, measuring that yourself or are you getting that from like your Moses tracker? I'm measuring that myself. The Moses tracker is great actually for, because it will provide all of that. But I don't have a lot of Moses star trackers yet. I just have one. So, you know, when I'm shooting kind of this basic stuff, with like locked off camera shots, I feel like it's kind of, it's like overkill. When you move a camera, obviously you need like a tracking system. But for a locked off camera shot, usually we get a, get by with like enough. I'll just shoot a little laser level down, shoot it at the like where we're at, kind of get a few basic measurements, write it down in a little book, and then I'll um, send it over. Yeah, a, a lot of this stuff is kind of manual. And then we'll get a finished cut from my editor. We'll send it to my CG guy. He'll go render it all out. We'll send it back to my edit. Well, we'll send it to review. So then we'll all kind of look at it. What do we think? What's hitting? What's not? We'll do pickups where we have to. And then we'll send it for sound design and final editing to my editor. We'll do another review, probably a few more reviews. And then um, we're kind of shooting pickups the whole way. Like this doesn't work. This works. We need to cut away this sooner. But that's a that's a way where we don't do too much double work. I mean, basically with CG, your biggest costs are your um, your artist time and your artist's rendering, like your rendering capacity. You know, we've tried to do like build render farms and stuff. That's a whole other thing. But uh, and we're not that sophisticated yet. But it's still a problem. Like you can't just render. You don't have infinite render capacity, so you have to just manage that. So that's that's our pipeline right now. And I will say, to much to the chagrin of all of you, Unreal Engine lovers out there. We do not use Unreal Engine. We're still in Blender. I mean, we're Blender lovers here. All our scenes are rendered out in Blender. That's how we've done it for the past, I think, two years now. All of the world, the, the world, the virtual, the, the rooms, everything. Everything. And so is it Blender? And then now's a good time. Let's talk about Eximetry. How did Eximetry come on your radar? And like, what role is it playing in your pipeline? So Eximetry came on my radar, yeah, because I was exploring keying options. And I was really not happy with hardware keyers because of how you have to loop, like the, the loop thing. I hate that. Mm. I was like, this is so, this should all be done in software. Why do I have basically a computer separate from my computer doing the keying when I could just have my computer do the key? Like it just makes so way So you don't overload sense. your computers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right, by the way. That's actually true. Yes. <laughs> that's actually true. But, uh, but Eximetry, you know, they have a, I don't want to say lightweight, but they, they have a keyer that like basically could run with my computer. So I kind of uh, figured that out, begged them to sort of work with me. They're like, all right, that's cool. So I got a license and then, yeah, I started working with that and I was just amazed by how this like node-based system works. If you guys haven't used Eximetry before, you basically, it's basically a node-based editor, but for video. And so instead of like, I don't know what a lot of people are familiar with, OBS or stuff like that, you basically like pull in a camera input, but then you can apply like a node layer of like a LUT or you can add like some camera correction or some blur. Then you can add another thing. Then you can add a keyer. Then you can add this. Then you can add that. And you can kind of add all this logic in with it, which I really like. So um, I kind of jumped in that as a way to do what is essentially live. So live uh, production without... Yeah, like a in-camera yeah, it's like a, visual effect. Yeah, yeah like it, basically in-camera visual effects w without um, Unreal. I don't know. I've, I've just kind of always had a bad experience with Unreal. It never really runs fully real time on my computer. So I'm like, if it's not fully real time, then I get pissed. And I'm like, I, we should just, if we're going to just have to do it in post, let's just do it in Blender. Um, because I think the, like the renders out of Blender are slightly better. So Eximetry provided me a real way with like rendered backgrounds. So if you're doing locked off shots, you can do pre-rendered backgrounds that loop. And so I was like, for anything we're doing locked off, let's film it live so I don't have to go back and like, we don't have to spend computation or post-processing mm -hmm. keying or anything. Like, let's just do it all live. Um, so that's our pipeline for live stuff. And then our pipeline for not live stuff, which is usually like bespoke shots where we're not confident the keyer is going to, you know, pull everything the first time. Or we, we want it to be a little more, anything that's sort of cinematic mm -hmm. and we're not sure which camera angle we're going to pick yet will do in post. But anything sort of at the desk, the main desk is all uh, composited live. And that's just a way to save a ton of time because we used to extend it all to key light or to pre-mat for like king in post. And that was just not good. Your main A cam, B cam shots where you're in your the studio, you're at your desk, you're talking, you're kind of giving main storyline points. Originally, you're saying that you used to just record the raw files, green screen background. Yes. Composite it later. And yes. post replace the background. No, well, the first time was in OBS for live king that way. 
Then I was like, I want this to look nicer. So then we did it in post. Then I was like, this sucks in post. How do I do it live but good? Live but not OBS kind of terrible king. And that's when I found Eximetry and I haven't looked back since. Sorry. Okay, well, so all of your Blender, the renders, the the set pieces brought into Eximetry, layered with your camera, your nodes, and that you're, you're rolling and that is uh, Final Pixel in camera. You don't have to do anything to that in post. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, and I'm super happy with that. And then recently we've kind of wanted to get away from the whole like uh you know everything's locked off i think i think for virtual production especially it can start to like like you can start guessing the world you're like okay no cameras moving you know i kind of feel like this is a bit of a 2d world i could push it over with like a with you know i could and the world would topple over touch Um, touch your background yeah yeah i can just touch the background So I really started to get obsessed with this idea of, you know, really, if I can move the camera, it's going to blow people's minds because how can you move, you know, it's just sort of like the next evolution of that whole thing. So I started getting obsessed with the idea of, you know, how do we do that? I looked into match moving. One theme with me is I'm always trying to cheat work. Like I'm always trying to make things faster, but then it ends up (laughs) making me do before work. So, uh, so like I, mean, I think I that's the jo- definition of life hacking, where it's like, I'd rather spend 50 hours to figure out how to yes. do this task that I could do in two minutes when it would have taken me five minutes yeah. to do it. Yeah. yeah, I have a joke with my friends. Like, I work all night just to not have to do the same thing twice. <laughs> like, just to not have to do the same five-minute task twice. I will spend, you know, all night troubleshooting how to build a system for this. So I, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to match move every time. There's got to be a better way. Sure, turns out there is, but it's uh, it's with live camera tracking. And that's when I got into that. I feel like that's where a lot of the like tech demos, a lot of the progress on the forefront of virtual production is. So I started looking into sort of the Vive trackers. You know, that didn't work. Too much jitter. I really think like trying to solve camera jitter with smoothing and de-jitter and all that kind of stuff is a fool's errand. Not a fool's errand, but it's a lot of crap. Like a lot of post fixing in time. Yeah. And it's crap in, crap out. Like you need really high fidelity data. I won't go into the specifics of why I feel this way, but I spent so much time trying to... Eximetry has all these tools actually for de-jittering, camera smooth, like motion smoothing. And I spent forever trying to create the perfect system for that. You just need good data. Like that's what it comes down to. You just need awesome camera data if you're going to do live tracking. And so for, I know they've been actually improved. So I don't, I can't speak to where they are now with the Mars and stuff. When you, when least, you were using Vive, was this like when you had no, to these were the like hack, when you had just had to hack the puck yes, without the headset? Yes, yeah. Yes. Okay, so to clarify, this is not the Vive Mars system. No, 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 no. And released. I don't want to, yeah, I cannot that, okay. speak. So to I clarify speak everyone, on, right, if you're like, no, yeah, this is not their this dedicated is also, Vive I don't even Mars think they. I don't even system. think they had like a dedicated Ethernet yet. Like it was, it was just really. No, that was my, of, this was my first experience too. And I, I bought the pucks and then I like realized like, oh, it's like, where's your headset? I'm like, I don't want, I don't, I don't want the headset. Yeah, and then yeah, I had to yeah, find yeah, out yeah. you had to like jailbreak it to like get it to right. work. I was like, uh, right. okay. <laughs> I was part of that wave of like trying yeah. to figure that out. Then they tried like anti latency. Uh, that was fine, but uh, I got the floor model because I didn't have enough clearance to get the ceiling model. The and what I found right. is as you walk on the floor, the sensors are moving slight. Like even though you won't even see it, that like there's some like a little bit or you can include the sensors. And I just wasn't getting great data from them either. So um, eventually I was like, who's the industry using? Like, what, what are the, what is the industry using? I found there's not a super clear answer to that. The industry uses a lot of things. But one of the things the industry uses is like Moses. And I saw some of their demos and I was like, this looks really good. And it looks like a workhorse. And at that point, I was so fed up with trying to troubleshoot all the time. Caveat, nothing is set and forget in virtual production. Nothing. But... I want something that is as close to possible, set and forget it. And so that's when I found the Star Tracker. I started talking to them about working with them. Ever since I got that, that's been finally has gotten as close to pixel perfect as I can get. The data coming in is really good. At this point, it's more about like figuring out how to solve for camera lens distortion on different lenses and like, you know, focus breathing. The things that, you know, you take for granted you, or you don't even realize are problems when you're just trying to solve the like tracking quality part, but then you're like, oh, now there's this whole new set of issues. But yeah, th- so that's been my process with figuring that out. It's super fun, it's super rewarding, and it's super hard. I mean, it's like, it's all of those things. And I still think like, I just wanna, I guess I wanna say this. Virtual production, indie virtual production, as far as locked off cameras, I think is 100% approachable. I think 
Exymmetry plus some rendered scenes, totally doable for a workable pipeline from every YouTuber. Mm -hmm. And you can get final pixel in camera, yes. like not yes. to touch it afterwards. In indie virtual production for moving cameras, I don't think is quite approachable for the layman YouTuber. And I mean that because I say that as like, I've developed my pipeline as my resources have sort of expanded. But I know when I started on YouTube, I could have never afforded the tools I needed for moving a camera. Like, there's just so much you need to get a working workflow for um, moving camera virtual production that I think is worth being really honest about that and not saying like, oh, this is approachable to a guy who can only afford a camera and some lights. Like, it's not yet. You can do a lot with a basic green screen some basic lights and a camera, but you, but as far as like trying to get into the moving camera shots, unless you're willing to spend some time, I think match moving is maybe the closest thing to an, like a cheap workflow for that. But even then it's, it's hard. Yeah. I mean, I think the only viable indie solution for that right now is if you're fine filming on your iPhone, because there are a handful of solutions. Even next imagery came out with an app yeah. recently. And so if yeah. you're fine filming on your iPhone, because the iPhone has all of these sensors that we need built into it. Yeah. The, um, the kit's actually pretty good. Yeah. Um, so that, yeah, that's the v most viable indie solution, I think, right now. Um, but yeah, if you want to get a bigger camera, track that, then it's going to get it more starts, complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's a, it gets a lot more complicated. But it's fun to develop into that because I'm still budgeting every year like to try to build up to a workable pipeline. I mean, I still, I just recently got my first dolly. And then you realize, oh, the dolly's not stable enough. I should have some tracks with this dolly. But the tracks cost like $2,000. I mean, it's like, this stuff is just ridiculously expensive to get into the kind of world of, yeah. you know, world of actual, you know, production. So um, I always like to say that because I think it is fantastic that this world is becoming approachable. But, you know, you also have to be, you know, I think it's just responsible to kind of be honest about where the world is approachable as of now, where it's not. I think what's exciting is to the people who are first come a lot of the spoils. I mean, I think the first people who can sort of figure this out, you know, get a lot of the benefits of, hey, that thing's new. I haven't seen it before. That's really cool. Because in five to 10 years, I think what I'm doing now won't be as noteworthy because people have already done it. Everyone will be in their metaverse virtual studio recording their uh, Everyone's going to do it. Yeah. And everyone's going to be like, oh, that's so, ch you're so lazy <laughs> for doing that. And then it's stuff that we've all been like spending hours right yeah. now trying to figure yeah. out um, well, i think i think of the the nkbhd studio tour and he's explaining you know why he has a robot camera like a half million dollar robot camera you know and he's like it's just to differentiate the channel with these types of shots because yeah. tech reviews nobody are easy else can get it. and no one's right no one's going to do this and to go to that extent for the tech totally. review um with the shots that you are moving uh are you just recording on green screen and doing post stuff um, afterwards or like are any of those shots final pixel or are you doing post work to them nope all of them are post. I'm slightly skeptical of um, indie virtual production final pixel. And what I mean by that is I think if you have a ton of people on set, a ton of experts, you can do all that. Because basically final pixel just means you move all your production to pre-production. And what I do is everything is negotiable after you film. That actually turns out to be a really good thing when you're limited by people. So when your problem is not time on set and like like I, I think it's just a lot because I, I my my problem is not equipment just being here I, I I have all the equipment but I don't have the people um whereas you know if you're renting a space and you only have 30 days but you can spend as much as you want on resources yeah it's worth moving everything to pre-production and you know solving it there but uh I've been keeping an eye on the like live space and I think it comes with its own set of challenges I think the green screen is a bit it's just not like sexy because it's not new. So I think people are sleeping on it. But actually, it turns out to be really nice to be able to solve all your problems after you filmed it and be like, oh, we can just insert this. Oh, we can change this. Oh, we can do that. Um, and we don't have to pull talent back on set because there is this part like, oh, actually, in the edit, we should have had this for continuity reasons. What do we have to do? We have to put everything back, call everyone back to set get a new take, make sure that take matches with the old take. I mean, Final Pixel is like cool when you get it the first time. When you don't get it the first time, it actually sucks because you can't fix anything. It's Final Pixel. It's like, it's done. So um, 
all our like cinematic stuff where we're moving stuff, that's all most of the work is done in post. And um, I'm quite happy about that. I'm, and I'm keeping stuff in post for that. This probably then answers my next question is like, are LED panels on your radar and going that route instead of green screen? But this probably just answered that question. Yeah. Yeah. No. Just not, not enough not, man, uh, people right power to, no, to, to do, I, like, just because you have to get it all set up ahead of time and like have. I, I, I guess, I guess the answer is never like a full no. I mean, I feel like it's the same answer of like CGI versus practical. It's like, there are points where these things are more useful than the other. The point where, you know, right now I'm shooting in a, I'm trying to create a second set for a unrelated project. Anyway, I'm trying to use a really small space. So I don't have enough distance from the, um, the wall. And I started realizing, oh, actually like an LED panel that I could pull some bulk on would actually be useful because instead of getting a lot of spill on me, I could just have natural lighting. So there's like cool stuff to LED panels, which is really nice. And if you get the right setup, I think also, um, shout out to, gosh, I forgot his name, the jet guy, something jet, uh, on YouTube. He built a set where he's, his windows, I want to say potato jet, but oh, that's definitely yes. not it. I do know who he was windows. Um, he used like an LED, like TVs for his windows. He used an LED panel. Yes. And I, th- I thought that was genius. I was like, this is the perfect use case for that problem. And like it can cast real light on like window shades even. You can have this curtain that's semi seat like sheer and all the lighting, it like looks nice. So I think everything's a tool, right tool, yeah. right job. And you as an artist will find your own like preference for tools. Like uh, this is true with, you know, anybody who's like uh, like building a house. Everybody knows some tools are better for some jobs, but then there's those gray zones where it's like, I prefer such and such. I just like using it and I prefer or I prefer this. So um, I think that's true. You kind of have to develop your own style for, OK, I know kind of how these tools work. You don't want to say no to any of them outright. But maybe I prefer this. I prefer this set of tools. I prefer, you know. Yeah, two tools. I sort of a touch on what we just talked about. And I don't know if they're on your radar. One was Ghost Frame. It was a company we filmed at NAB last year. Their solution was sort of for this problem you're describing where they can display multiple images on the LED panel simultaneously. So like you can record your virtual background, but then you could also have a green background and like a tracker background. So you're recording like three separate videos where if you need to composite or switch out things later on, and then Kinoflow came out with the Mimic Lighting, which is basically a super bright LED panel where you can feed it images and stuff and use that as like your lighting source, which actually leads me into one of my other questions. The noir lighting that goes across your face, and I'm sorry about the drilling in my background. Uh, the noir lighting that goes across your face, the coffee steam from your mug. Do you add those in post? Um, so sorry, I had to write down that Mimic Lighting keynote. That's cool. I've never heard of that. I'm probably going to check that out. And then as far as... Oh, gosh, you got to a bunch of great stuff. But but let me answer your question about the um, the noir lighting is is actually practical. The window. That's great. Yeah, yeah that's great. No, no, no. Th- so so that I thought of because I found ex- Aperture had some uh, gobos with like Venetian uh-huh. blinds, like fake Venetian blinds. I was like, gosh, that would sell so well. Like I think feel like they we, made that for you. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And and then we, we were like, yeah, and then let's put some CGI Venetian blinds in the background. And then it just works because... You, it, I think that one light has sold my show so well because it it creates this like it's on me, but then it's in the background. And so your mind goes, ah, it has to be, you know, anytime you can create stuff like that, like where you're you have some kind of motivated lighting or in that case, it's not from the back. It's actually kind of you're selling it in the background in the in the front. But um, it's always worth it. Then the coffee steam is created actually in post. That's like CGI'd on as like a plate later. I just realized, oh, if I put my coffee cup up, I will never cross that boundary. So it'll never be a problem. Um, So I should just do this. I thought of so many ways to do that practically. It actually fun. These are like fun little. See, if you if you like problem solving, virtual production is for you. (laughs) <laughs> because it's constant problems and it's, con- sorry, I, I like I have allergies, but it's constant problems. It's constant problem solving. Uh, um, so like one funny thing we found, <clears throat> I created, I got a little fog fog machine because I was like, oh, let me just fog machine. I'll cut a hole through my desk and I'll get a fog machine and I'll just kind of have it drip. It was a great idea. But then you realize one, the fog doesn't work like steam and like just blow, like it doesn't, it doesn't work. So then I was like, well, maybe I'll put a boiler under there and I'll perpetually be boiling water to like create real steam. 
Um, no one's going to have here, seen yeah. this level yeah. of, you know, <laughs> I'm such a genius. But then I, but then I started trying to key it and I was like, oh crap. It actually yeah. creates all these problems because the steam creates its own layer of like opaqueness. So it's like half opaque, which keyers can do, but it's like not great. And it just created so many headaches. And then I was like, well, <laughs> I told my artist, like, hey, can you find me, like, a loop of steam? And I put it on, and it just looked perfect, like, the first time. And I was like, all right, well, I should have not wasted all this time trying to... So, um, yes, it, there is this fun thing when you're trying to, like, figure stuff out. There's, like, this fun problem solving of, should I do it in post? Should I do it in live? Should I do it practical? Should I do it CGI? And um, if your brain looks like works like mine does, like, that's just a really fun part of the job is figuring all that out. Going back to the, the entire workflow process, um, assuming you know, your research and everything done, how long is, are these videos taking now from, let's say the script's done to you know your, your, the video's complete? So I'm just going to assume you mean like workable draft because the, the script kind of will change a little bit over time, but a, a workable draft... Enough that you're going into production or you're, doing, or you're doing your previous stuff. For a full like show, it's a month to two months. But that's like mm -hmm. a full... We have... Things where we're still at the desk and we don't do a ton, we'll do maybe a few graphics. And then we have our, you know, more in-depth investigations where we're trying to put together like a full narrative. And those will take a month to two months of actual production work. And how big is the team? Editor? Uh, myself. So I, I, myself, I have an editor and a CGI artist. And I am trying as hard as I can to stay that small. I believe in the power of small teams. I also believe in like team bloat is a real thing. And so I believe in working with super talented people. I'm trying to keep it small for now. Nice. And what other tech is on your radar that you might try to incorporate, like might be interested in? Um, this could go from AI, not just generated AI, but even AI for helping research. Um, all of the above. What's on your radar? Uh, for sure, not AI to research. I think that's a disaster. One hallucination is the end of my... I mean, more like um, analyzing documents or just like finding patterns or like not even yeah. not like, hey, ChatGPT, tell me this, but like just... I will, I will say I used AI for one thing. I was trying to analyze like 50,000 emails and I had to create a Python script and I was like, I could hire it out. But then I was like, I wonder if I can figure this out, you know, with chat GPT. I know a little bit of code, like a baby amount. Anyway, it helped me figure out like a quick Python script yeah. uh, to pull a bunch of stuff. So that's useful. You Again, you can't, I, I, I don't believe in saying no to the tool. I've found that for like mood boarding and stuff, actually AI is a great way to come up with some ideas. Like for mood boards, mm -hmm. like, hey, I want to create X, Y, Z, but I only, I'm not a great artist. I'm not a great, like, maybe I can't visualize everything in my head, but I can describe what I want. If I can describe what I want, I can create like a, a bespoke mood board, basically, if I'm willing to spend the time to kind of get it. There are a bunch of things I could go into there. There's some problems with all that stuff copyright wise, which uh, I guess we won't dive into. But as far as like tech that's on my radar, I really am obsessed with trying to learn this craft. I mean, I don't think there's any shortcuts. I really want to learn. I'm trying to figure out what's next in terms of operating the camera, like like grip wise. I'm trying to figure out like, am I going dolly? Am I figuring out gimbals? Am I figuring out steady cam? Which is all kind of old tech. Gimbals, not so much, but the other two. And... I think adding that to my repertoire is kind of huge. I don't think you ever also get above like sort of the basics of, you know, learning more about lighting, learning more about framing. At this point, I think a lot of like the cool gear, I'm starting to at least have my hands nearby. I'm like getting my hands near the gear. Now it's sort of about, okay, becoming a master of that gear. I, I am a big believer in the idea of like, just like virtual production is never gets above the storytelling. Like you, like virtual production is great, but it always is subservient to the storytelling. I think tools are great, but they're always subservient to your skill with the tool. A new tech is always sexy and I'm always like interested in things like mimic lights and all that stuff. But I really believe this, like all these things are like how you use it. So what I'm excited about trying to push the world forward in is not necessarily like breaking new ground. Or, you know, creating anything, but like using them in kind of new artistic ways that hopefully people haven't seen before on YouTube. Yeah. Um, we didn't really touch on it. And I know this is going to come up in the comments if I don't ask it. But what is the gear stack of like cameras, lights, editing software, uh, just the tech stack behind okay. everything? Okay. Yeah. Shout out to all my, uh, all these tech people who make things like this possible. Um, <clears throat> so tech stack. I'm a Sony boy. Love Blackmagic, but 
I need autofocus. I need a snappy autofocus. I'm in the Sony world. FX3, I think, is like the greatest camera ever for most things. For virtual production, you need timecode. Um, so, or not, not timecode, you need sync, which is different from timecode, which I learned slowly. I literally had to, anyway, that's a whole thing. I try, I tried forever to like, like do use timecode for sync. It's a disaster. If you don't know what I'm talking about and you want to get into it, learn before you buy. Um, anyways, FX9 is my like virtual production dedicated camera because it has sync. It's also just an amazing camera because the low light performance is so good because you have the, uh, dual true dual base ISO. I know people say dual base ISO. It's not actually dual base ISO, um, which is also a fun thing you learn. But generally, I think the FX3 is absolutely good enough for everything else. Um, such an incredible camera, like the, from the picture quality to the sensor to the low light performance. Because actually one thing I should say, when you're working with green screen, you want low light performance, guys. The reason for that is because you're always fighting between three things, which are always trying to pull away lighting. You're fighting for a deep focus, because you don't want things bokeh out because then you will have a hard time keying it uh, because the blurred out part would be green. It'll be like a mix of green and your actual props and stuff. So you want that. You also want as low of an ISO as possible for low noise because you, you don't want to key noisy footage. And then you also want a shutter speed that doesn't have a bunch of motion blur. So all of those things make you like have less light. So because of that, you don't want super noisy cameras. So the FX3, I think is the right place as far as their low light performance is good enough to where you can basically pull off enough lighting to kind of get what you need. But that's that's a hard lesson that I've learned for sure. So that's on the camera side. Uh, my mics are a mix of like uh, the, whatever that Sennheiser, like famous shotgun mic is, the M418, 416, 416 yeah. whatever. Uh, and then th like this is great, the Shure SM7B, I think. Tracking stuff, Moses all the way, huge fan of them. I've heard good things about Vicon as far as like production. I know like professionals use that. I would say if I was to do it all over again, I would have skipped a lot of the indie options. I just don't think there are tracking fidelities there, but I also haven't been in that world for a while. So people can correct me in the comments. Maybe it's come a long way. I don't know. Software side, I'm obsessed with Eximetry. I think Eximetry is the key people are sleeping on. Everyone's in the old days of the Ultimate, I think software-based gears are far superior. I will die on that hill. I don't care. Um, I, I'm just, I'm serious. I, you got like, like compositing with hardware gears. Anyway, <clears throat> I think it's a uh, trash. Oh, lights, lights, real quick, lights. Aperture, I believe in going mm. into one ecosystem. DMX is also a great system, but it's also kind of an old system. So I think the Citus link is like a game changer in terms of lighting. Uh, I know other ecosystems do their own like version of an app-based uh, lighting control, but it just saves a ton of time because I have all these like pre snapshots saved on my phone and I can just like press a button. It's like, hey, here's how you lit this set perfectly last time. We'll just give it to you. You can change it later and set up a new snapshot, but um, you can always go back to the old one. So I, I think that's so good. Whatever you do with lighting, I think trying to find an ecosystem really makes your life easier. I mean, sometimes you can't avoid getting, I have a few lights that aren't in my ecosystem because they're just cheaper or, you know, better with somebody else. But I believe in going with one ecosystem. And then um, I use like a little mod, like a teleprompter here just to let me see you and me at the same time, which is really mm -hmm. nice. So I can look directly into lens. So I think that's a, a huge thing. Are you doing your scripts off a teleprompter when you're recording? Yep. Uh, mostly. Depends. Depends on the video. But I, I do like to because I, I think... At least my work, a lot of the facts, like you can't, f you don't want to like accidentally <laughs> fudge them. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're off by like a factor of 10. That's a problem. So, um, and I have been wrong about that before and I've had to apologize. So that's something you don't want to get wrong. And so teleprompters are great for making sure you're like on track with that. And then, yeah, I think that's mostly it. I recently got a treadmill that I use for like my, like, uh, like I walk on my treadmill at work, but I think I'm going to spray paint it green and that's going to be a new addition to the, speaking of things you shouldn't do, but I'm going to do it because, because I don't see how you can do a practical <laughs> treadmill that's actually the floor. So I think I'll have to pull that, but so I think that'll be fun. Nice. And, uh, I know you're not editing, but, uh, any idea premiere resolve, the, the we're in premiere, but I love, I love the tools resolve has, I think they're getting really competitive. It's kind of frustrating. Cause I'm like, I want to do some things in resolve like camera or anything color related is so much better resolve, like Dehancer. I think it's available for Premiere Pro, but some of the tools for DaVinci is just so cool. So 
they're kind of screwing me over because they're making it a hard choice. I don't want to switch over. I've toyed around with like maybe sending stuff to Resolve and then to Premiere. That's just kind of a whole nightmare though. Wish I wish they would play nice because then we could all be happy. One happy ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. never going to happen. Yeah, well, so I mean, I know you uh, don't get a chance to talk about this kind of stuff often. So anything we didn't cover worth mentioning or you want to talk about? I will say, I will say, I think it's worth um, mentioning when you get into this stuff, usually you're like watching people who have figured a lot of stuff out. That's why you're watching them. But I think the great thing about this world and the great thing about YouTube specifically is you don't have to be a fully formed project. And I think my show is a testament to that. I think a lot of people's kind of enjoyment about the production is that I wasn't always polished and I'm still not as polished as I'd like to be. I think you spoke to that like in the first question, kind of bring it full circle. People enjoy watching the journey. So if you're thinking about getting into this, you know, I know I've said a lot about, you know, where things are, where things aren't, you know, this technology moves so fast. Um, so I think you still very much are on the ground floor and you can figure it out as you go on YouTube, which is kind of the best part. I think in Hollywood, in kind of more mainstream production, there's more of a, you kind of have to have it all done. You can't be figuring it out on the fly as much. But I think that's the great thing about YouTube. So if you're on YouTube, you're thinking about taking the plunge, I think it's awesome. This this work is super sick, and I'm excited to see pe more people kind of take it on, not just from the tech side, but also trying to use it practically for just as a tool of kind of building art. Yeah, just all about, at the end of the day, all about telling more interesting and better stories. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Stephen. I really appreciate the time and uh, nerding out about this with you. Uh, yeah. Normally, I, I ask, where can people learn more? But um, in this case, just CoffeeZilla. Go to YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just have fun talking about this. I never I never get the chance to talk about it. I do kind of love keeping the ambiguity of, is it green screen? Is it not green screen? <laughs> but uh, I think in a space like this, it's fine to kind of pull back the curtain, tell you guys a few of my tricks a few of the kind of things we've been working on because I've gotten so much help from this community of that is where the people who are playing around with the tech just for the tech sake, they're also pushing it forward because they teach people like me how to use these tools. You know what I mean? I wouldn't be, you know, without people like Matt Workman, people who are, you know, kind of in the throes of building some of the, um, I, I think there's these guys co-pilot, I think. Uh, uh, video co-pilot. Or, oh no, it's just yeah. co-pilot. Yes, yeah. Those guys helped me massively when I got my Star Tracker. So the people who are building these um, uh, tutorials and stuff, I didn't want to poo-poo on them because they're also making, they're building the runway for the rest of us to sort of take off. Um, so shout out to those guys. Cool, well, thanks a lot, Stephen. Appreciate it. And that is it for this episode of VP Land. Many thanks to CoffeeZilla, aka Steven, for sharing all the insights and a peek behind the scenes of what goes on in making his excellent videos and his journey into virtual production. Links for everything that we talked about are in the show notes, either on YouTube in the description or over on the show notes on the website at vp-land.com. And again, be sure if you enjoyed this episode, you'll most likely like our VP Land newsletter, which covers a whole bunch more stuff like this. So go get it as well, same website. Let me know what you thought about this episode and if you've got any other questions or requests of who you want to see in the YouTube comments. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next episode.